Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Torsten. No one wants to lose, of course. But um, I know it's a, it's a very, very tough time. And I have to disappoint you in, a, yeah, in several ways. First, I have to come back to the original question. I won't talk a lot about ablation, mitroclip, and other things we can do with those patients. So we have to come back a little bit more to reality. And we have to also take into account other treatment options we have today. So, and the second, may, it may the second point, it may not really be a pro and con discussion since my task, and I didn't change the topic, is the, to answer the question, is LAA occlusion an alternative to oral anticoagulation in low bleeding patients, low risk patients? And my point should be, no, it should be limited to anticoagulation contraindicated patients. And I would say 100% true, and I would guess that 100% of you would say, yes, that's right. And I think it's right because we have better options in 2016. Of course, we are not reluctant to implant LAA, LAA occluder in patients who have chronic atrial fibrillation, who have a certain risk profile, who have a life expectancy of more than five years, of course, and who are not, who are not candidates for oral anticoagulation, maybe due, due to angiodysplasia, recurrent bleeding, renal insufficiency, we heard about that. And we have the elegant option to implant a Watchman device, not with 3D uh, printing maybe, maybe with CT, maybe without, but uh, with very low amount of uh, um, contrast media, we can do that. And in the more complex cases, on those where we want to stay a little bit more proximal, we can do this with the, um, for example, with the AMOLED device also in a very elegant way. So that's, that's no doubt, we can do that. But now come back, we come back to the yeah, reality. Which are the patients we are, we are treating? I just brought our, our cohort and uh, you see all patients in blue, they have, they have had an intracranial bleeding or in green, they had a GI bleeding or they had a left atrial appendage problem in brown or the others, another um, type of um, and um, this follows basically the guidelines, and there are good reasons for these guidelines. And I know, and you all know, that this is, was not exactly what has been investigated in Protect AF. But we have, of course, a safety and efficacy issue when we want to treat not 700 patients like in Protect AF, like 70,000 patients or more, like in the NOAC trials. So that's the point. And if we have a look at the Protector F data, I can make this very brief. We know that the non-inferiority has been shown compared to vitamin K antagonists, but that we had a significant safety issue. And this has to be taken into account when this treatment option is applied at the broad community and not in the expert round like here. And also long-term re success rate and the efficacy rate when you, once you have, have um, have, have uh, let this, this hurdle of safety issue behind has been elegantly shown as also demonstrated by my, uh, my, my partner in this talk. And this, the, the, the meta-analysis has also been shown by him, which, which showed that the efficacy is, uh, the, the, the is non-inferior to vitamin K antagonists, and if you put all these data together. But you know that the number of patients which are included in this trial is rather low as compared to the anticoagulation, anticoagulation trial. And I will come back to that later. And now we have to go back to reality. I mean, of course, there's always a limitation if you have a look at the registries, but these registries, I think, is very important. More than 1,000 patients, you know, it has been quoted this morning, just published a couple of days ago. And my partner in this talk already mentioned that most of them were unsuitable for normal anticoagulants. That's the reality. One, a two-third of the cohort. And we still have a minor safety issue. We have to, we have to acknowledge that. This has been, of course, tremendously improved during the course of the, of the trial from almost 9% uh, to 2.7%, but 2.7% major complications in the evolution trial and in the 
real-world scenario, for example, like in our center, when we started okay. the number of procedures in increased in blue, and we had uh, two tamponades in, in uh, 100 patients, no strokes, so 2% major complication in our cohort. So that's probably what you have to take into account when you, when you apply this uh, modality. This treatment, and you are not successful in 100, 100%, and you may also leave residual gap. You are all aware of this, this problem, and this has also been shown in the evolution trial with a success rate of device implantation in 98.5%, so really increasing over time. In our experience, we are a little bit uh, between the results, 95%. So <clears throat> if you put this together, you have like 5% complication, 5% plus, plus minus 2 or 3% complication and uh, not adequate positioning of, of the device. And we know that this uh, leakage problem has been described in up to 30% probably with a novel uh, implantation technology and a novel, uh, in, the, in the newer um, experience, not in that high amount. Another issue, my second issue, it's very important. We have to rethink, we have to challenge our thoughts about the pathogenesis of stroke in atrial fibrillation. We know from a third trial that short subclinical atrial fibrillation episodes lasting not more than six minutes may represent a risk marker for stroke. And in this dark, uh, the dark curve indicates the cause of the patients who had this SCAF episodes. So they had a one 10% uh, uh, incidence in this trial and a 2.5-fold stroke rate increase in this cohort with very, very short-lasting atrial fibrillation episodes. And if we have a closer look at this cohort and at the patients who had a stroke, who, who never had any apparent neurological uh, symptom before during the course of the trial, these 51 patients, and the, uh, these patients are depicted here, if you have a look at these, then um, you see that 50% um, uh, of them have SCARF episodes, and these SCARF episodes are shown here. 35% um, SCARF prior stroke. So there's not this strict link between stroke and the, the, the um, atrial fibrillation episodes, and only 4-8% within 30 days, and only one SCAF episode at the moment or at around the stroke uh, event. And this is shown here in, this, uh, in these uh, dark bars, and the gray zone shows the monitoring zone. So these dark bars indicate that there's only very weak association between atrial fibrillation and the stroke. So we really have to rethink our um, pathophysiological um, yeah, um, understanding. And we also know that it's not always the appendage. That's another issue. We know, especially in those who have an underlying heart disease, this um, paper has elegantly underscored this issue. 34 centers, more than uh, 250 cases with the LA thrombus, and you know that in those who have valvular heart disease, almost half are outside the appendage, but also in non-valvular heart disease, 10% outside the appendage. So. That's, it's not always like we, we think it is. And we have new opportunities. Why shouldn't we use them? We have now four, so let them play. And they're doing a good job. Yeah, they're really doing a great job. And when they don't perform the novel anticoagulants, you can e exchange them and can do something else. And we know that altogether we have 75,000 patients included in the trials. And if you use the right drug, with the right dosage, then you are even better than vitamin K antagonists, and you have a global, a global protection. And you can prevent bleeding, you can prevent major bleeding, you're also better than vitamin K antagonists if you use the novel anticoagulants. So, so this has led, as you know, all know, to the recommendation especially due to the fact that we also had an influence on the overall mortality, which shows a, a positive signal, had led to the conclusion that novel antagonists should be used in most um, patients rather than vitamin K antagonists. And this has not been stressed by my yeah, partner in this talk with one word, that we have these alternatives, and that we also have them in the real-world scenario. We know 
this FTA analysis, all the analysis from Scandinavia now with hundreds of thousands of patient years, and we know that exactly the benefit we found in the controlled trials like RELY has been shown in real life as well. So in, uh, in, 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 yeah, the focus is the, the reduction of intracranial bleeding almost or more than 50%. So coming back to our, our patients with the uh, uh, LA, a appendage occluder, they also need some kind of antithrombotic treatment after, after, after implantation. You all know that. And if you look in the evolution trial and in the paper, then after implantation, the anticoagulation regimen was even increased in these cohorts. So you, you need more anticoagulation, you need more antiplatelet uh, um, anti treatment in the initial phase, of course. And this is very heterogeneous. There's no uniform strategy on that. And then, finally, probably all, everybody would agree, the standard, not everybody does it, and not every, everybody, every patient takes it, but the standard is antiplatelet treatment on a long-term basis. And we all know what antiplatelet treatment means. We don't use it anymore for atrial fibrillation. This study, the Everos, you all know, has been stopped, of course, not including left atrial appendage occluder, but compared to, to um, apixaban, this has been, uh, the aspirin had a, had a disastrous effect, so this uh, trial was stopped, and that was not, that's not my point. The point is that if you compare the bleeding and the stroke rate between aspirin and apixaban, you end up with the same, uh, with the same level. You don't really have a a benefit if, um, yeah, if, if, you, um, if you take aspirin. So taking all these arguments together and just focusing on the question which was posed to me, I would say we really have better options in 2016 than using the left atrial appendage occluder in low-risk patients, in low-risk patients. Why? We have a very large database on the use of NORC and on the benefit of NORC. On, from the trials and from real-world experience. And we need, of course, a uh, continuous antiplatelet treatment even after left atrial appendage occlusion. We have the problem still of failure and complications, especially when we use this treatment in a, in a very large-scale basis and not only in very, very dedicated, specialized centers who perform many interventions in other uh, entities than left atrial appendage occluding. And the other aspect, it's not always the left atrial appendage. We have, the, we have evidence for um, extra appendage source of, of uh, thrombi and a mechanism we have to think about uh, causing uh, thromboembolic events. So we need a global anticoagulation approach, at least as the first step, unless we encounter problems with that. So I strongly argue for not performing left atrial appendage occlusion in any patients. And I just want to follow the course director. That's always, I think, a good decision to follow the course director. He says, the evidence of efficacy and safety is currently insufficient to recommend these approaches for any patients other than those in whom long-term oral anticoagulation is contraindicated. Thanks for your attention.